case you didn't know, hopefully everyone heard that uh, that's uh, taking place. All right, I will go ahead and uh, start to share the presentation. And again, this is, um, uh, everyone should have, will have access to this. And uh, what I like to do with these uh, is to basically share with uh, on screen, but then to be able to, to share all the notes will be posted on the Google Share document, the notes, the links, the references, the citations. So feel free to take notes or not take notes, but know that after this is finished, you'll have all of the material available to you on that shared Google document. So I'll just start off. Um, welcome. Welcome back, as I mentioned to some folks, and welcome to the newcomers. Thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, I'm just always thrilled to work with teachers around the world, regardless of um, where you are, what you're teaching. We all have that uh, in common, that we all are teaching, we care for our students. And, and if you're joining this session, you're, you're probably one of those uh, teachers that are, that are always looking uh, to find ways to continuously improve. And so those, those folks always have a special place uh, in my heart, uh, as I've been working for the past 20 years, uh, assisting instructors around the world uh, to enhancing their teaching. In particular, my research agenda, it focuses on uh, integrating emerging functional appropriate technology into the classroom. So you might imagine the past six months has been kind of busy uh, for me, and it's, uh, it's allowed me to kind of use some of the tools and research that I've been working with over the past uh, 20 years, uh, basically. I do want to start with this slide. Uh, some of you may recall that um, we did have a session last uh, spring, and that was more of a kind of a quick put together session of people that were uh, would like some help to uh, to learn how to, to migrate some of their courses online. I think we all did that as successfully as we could, and now during the summer, I'm working a lot more with people intentionally to think about what they might do for the, for the upcoming fall, the autumn, September type program. Uh, and to do that, uh, we sent out a survey. Hopefully some of you were part of that survey. Hopefully you're seeing some of this data and saying, yep, I remember uh, selecting that. And so the summer series over the next six weeks, every Wednesday uh, evening at your time, <clears throat> I basically selected the most popular topic and that's gonna be the first topic that we talk about, the second most popular uh, and so forth. So I'm hoping that uh, people that were interested in these uh, they might connect with, with some of these topics. I do want to remind folks, uh, just in case you're looking for some supplemental material, um, I do have a website. Uh, the website's posted on the shared Google Doc. You can certainly go out there and, and read some of, uh, of my background. More importantly, uh, you may want to read some of the papers and the research. So on my CV link, uh, I have um, a, a pretty good selection of about the 150 papers that I've published uh, with links. And so it should make it easier for you to read through those, identify the ones that you would like to learn more about, click on those, and most of them are open source. Uh, the ones that aren't, you should be able to access through your NYU um, library ac access um, um, permissions. So you might wanna check some of those out. The last link on there, I am, uh, most of you are included in my weekly email where I share with you uh, a current and timely a scholarship of teaching or teaching as research article. If you're not on that um, email list and you would like to be, please uh, send me your email and I'll include you on that. I do take uh, the summer off. And so the next one will be, I think mid-August, I'll start to share those again. If you'd like to see some of those over the past four years, you can click on that link and you can uh, review all of the articles that I've shared uh, over that time. So let's go ahead and, and jump into this. Uh, these are the sessions so I've taken from your data uh, today. Uh, the most popular one, which uh, I'm always a bit intrigued on, on uh, you know, what faculty think they're important. Uh, I think at this point, it might be different than it could have been six months ago or a year ago. But um, the number one thing is that it seems like people really would like to know more about is assessing, measuring, and evaluating uh, effective teaching. And I will be really clear about these terms. Some people just use the word evaluating teaching, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know what that means within our um, kind of our educational philosophy and terminologies. And then you can see right through the next weeks, um, you know, a little bit about self-regulated learning, project-based learning, how to evaluate project-based learning, teaching as research, which I'm thrilled to share some of that because I, I think a lot of that's been going on the past six months and I'd love to, to work with you on those topics if you're interested. And then accessible learning environments and finishing up with some social emotional competencies. 
So let's go ahead and just kind of jump in. I'm trying to keep this to one hour, 60 minutes. Uh, I think that's plenty of time to, for me to kind of talk with you. Uh, of course, remember, you can always ask questions during, after. If you do ask a question in the chat, I just have to remind you, if you haven't worked with uh, Zoom on the presenter mode, it's really difficult for me to see that because uh, I've got it in presentation mode. I can kind of see your faces and see what I'm doing. So if you have something in chat, I might not get to it right away. If you have something urgent on that slide, uh, feel free to just unmute and uh, share the question with me, or I'll get to the chat later. If it's a question that can be delayed, feel free to add that to our uh, shared Google Doc. I already have about four or five questions there. Um, and then I can answer those and kind of create a bit of a, an FAQ of frequently asked questions. And that can be a resource for everybody to look at. And I'll, of course, that uh, when I do that, I'll, I'll add citations and references and make that a little more rigorous. Uh, we are going to meet weekly, uh, every Wednesday evening, your time at this Zoom uh, link. So hopefully you didn't have any problem uh, accessing that. And as I mentioned, the shared Google Doc really helps me from having to try to get everything out there. We're going to talk and share, uh, but, but realize that uh, anything and everything that I do share will be uh, provided to you afterwards. And I would like to even use it as a bit of a uh, communication, uh, kind of an asynchronous communication. If you have thoughts or questions or want to share, you can post them on that shared Google Doc. And for those folks that uh, didn't join us in the spring, if you'd like, you can review. It's about 10, 15 pages worth of uh, material that we've already kind of discussed. So that might help you kind of bring up to speed if you want to review some of those uh, materials and citations from the spring. We have about 30 folks that have signed up. Um, so great to, to have you. Um, if you'd like, uh, sometimes people say, hey, can my, can my colleague join? Uh, the great thing about Zoom, especially this particular one, it takes up to 300. So you can invite anyone that you want to invite and they can join us. Uh, without any problem, just share this link with them uh, and they can join us uh, every Wednesday. Uh, do let me know if you have any questions. Here's my email. I'm happy to, to answer some of these. Um, but I thought before we begin, I wanted to do a really quick overview of some of these online teaching aspects because I think that's where people um, are really kind of, that's where our head is. I think that a lot of you, especially going through the program that you either just finished, congratulations, or that you're going through now, the TESOL graduate program, um, these are great programs uh, in that they are teaching you um, how to teach, you know, English. Uh, but also, I think that TESOL programs typically really integrate some, some foundational aspects of pedagogy. And so a lot of this may be reminders. Uh, at the same time, I find that a lot of our colleagues don't really have as solid of a background with online pedagogy. So I wanted to start off here with, uh, with Davis's work. And I'm just going to share a few major aspects of um, basically effective teaching approaches, methods, strategies uh, that are common. And I, I wanted to start with this because I found throughout the past six months and literally throughout the past 20 years um, that people, uh, instructors who teach online well, and this shouldn't be a big surprise, actually are effective teachers face-to-face. Uh, -face. And I'll even go one step further and share that typically um, they tend to be faculty who, who can teach well in any mode. And sometimes we want to make this a, a dichotomous decision, right? Offline and online. And, and that's really not what we should be looking at. Uh, we, have, we have faculty that teach uh, students abroad. Uh, we have them teach in museums. We have them teach in informal settings, experiential learning, service learning. There's a lot of modes that are currently that, that, are, that are out there being used. Um, and we find that if we attend to Davis's uh, um, common elements of effective teaching, we really become very uh, flexible in the mode. And when the mode changes, we certainly can still rely on some of these ways that we teach. Um, so the first one is that really effective teachers, no matter what, uh, they design, and I like this word, they really design um, their courses so that they're active and that they're attending to what we call these measurable learning outcomes. And I can't imagine that you're familiar with LOs. I'll use that abbreviation quite often. Uh, but learning outcomes are things that we want our students to be able to know, do, or believe after we finish working with them. So regardless of, of where they are, regardless of where we are, uh, we want to make sure that we have those learning outcomes that are measurable. We want to make sure that we're aligning those learning outcomes uh, to guide our assessments. Uh, I actually have a program called a Course Design Studio, and I offer a, a Google Sheet a spreadsheet that helps faculty really make sure that those that alignment is clear and how often uh, that alignment is. 
I would challenge any instructor to really think and look at, um, you know, what are our assessments, tests, quizzes, homeworks, and, and how do we come up with those? And how often do they align with the learning outcomes? And even one of my biggest questions is to ask uh, teachers, how do you come up with the amount of points? Or, or what is that assessment worth? Oh, it's worth 10% or 20%. And I'll ask, how did you come up with that? Um, and typically it should be some, you should have some rationale that you came up with it because it's aligned with a larger percentage of your learning outcomes. Uh, you know, this is, you know, effective teachers, both on and offline. It's really, it's more than what we cover. Uh, it's, it's kind of what we help students uncover, discover. And so we have to create these kind of uh, organizations and be very clear. You probably found already that um, being online can have some benefits. One of the biggest uh, challenges that I've found is uh, organization and communication. And uh, again, this isn't uh, the magic of technology. This is sometimes we just need to really be much more clear on what we expect, uh, the behaviors that we'd like to elicit from our students. So one of the major roles as well is that we need to remember, uh, and I feel like sometimes all of you probably know this, this is just these things that are common with on and offline, but we need to know that we're not here to provide information. Uh, you know, I always kind of challenge folks that if our students can Google something, maybe our role is, is misplaced. We need to be providing them things other than just knowledge. We need to be providing them how they connect knowledge, how they make sense of knowledge, how they process knowledge, how they can extend and extrapolate knowledge. What are these skills that we're actually teaching them so they can ultimately work without us? Uh, teachers that are effective offline are engaging their students in many ways. You're probably seeing more and more research came out. I just read a couple articles this morning uh, that there are ways that we can engage our students online. I'm here to tell you that it's, it's not easy. Um, it's not quick. It's not simple. <laughs> Uh, I find that anything that we've done face-to-face -face takes at least double, if not triple, the amount of time to organize these things to be online. Uh, but the good news is that you can actually engage our students online. And hopefully through these conversations, you're going to uh, pick up some of those techniques that you can integrate inside of your teaching. And obviously, we need to basically have some sort of environment that all students feel like they can be successful. Uh, we need to build some sort of relationship with them. Uh, something as small as, you know, arriving to your online class early, asking a few questions, seeing how they're doing, allowing them to actually share um, some of the problems and challenges of, of being online or remote or not being supported. These are really simple things to do. Yes, they do take some time, uh, but those, that kind of time can really be beneficial as we uh, provide along. And ultimately, you're going to hear me talk about this a lot. A lot. And I, I know that you probably have heard this, but this concept of feedback, um, some people use the term test or quizzes or assessment or evaluation, but it, it, the bottom line is we need to let our students know how things are going with them as often as possible. And I, I usually get a bit of a kickback of, well, that takes time and I don't have time. And so you have to think about some strategies. And there are some really nice, efficient strategies to provide that feedback uh, that won't take up all of your time. I wanted to kind of overlay that with uh, some principles of good practices. And this is an article that was written, uh, taking some foundational good practices and using technology as a lever, so as an overlay. And none of these should be a surprise to you. Hopefully you glance at these and say, yes, I understand that. I've been doing that. Um, yeah, that one as well. Oh, I should probably work a little bit more on these. So you're gonna see some repetition, right? So this, this concept of encouraging uh, student to student, student to instructor. I would really encourage you to think about how you're designing, being intentional about that, and watching some of the time if you're working with students online. The breakout rooms are great on a Zoom. I've been using them quite a bit. Um, I have found myself that uh, some of the techniques that I use, I used to use a one minute uh, paper chat, and so I would have students, uh, my, my faculty work with each other for one minute, and uh, that was great face to face. But if you've ever tried to do a one minute breakout on Zoom, I'm here to tell you that it didn't work for me because all one minute does is get you in, you say hello, and then you're back out. And it's a bit frustrating. <laughs> so you might think a little bit about uh, the time that it takes to do some of these. So that's a bit of a limitation. So I wouldn't do that directly face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to online with a one minute. Active learning, prompt feedback, none of these things are really um, uh, odd or unusual, but I would challenge all of us to ultimately sit down and look at your plans, look at your strategies, and determine which one of these, um, uh, if you're accessing and using all of these at some point throughout. 
So now let's kind of take this. Those are basically things that we thought about with effective teaching in general, and we overlay the tech lever. Let's walk through just a little bit of fairly recent research um, and what we, we think about with some of the best practices uh, for online learning. And if you haven't seen this one by now, right, this is, um, this is really key. Uh, we need to be present. And I think that this is one of these concepts of sometimes people say, well, what do you mean? How can I not be present? We all know we've been, we've had experiences, maybe sometime face to face where somebody that you were talking with, they weren't really present. They were thinking of something else or they were someplace else in their minds. So we need to be present, which means we need to be um, connecting with them when we do have them synchronous. We need to be connecting with them when we're asynchronous with announcements and, and emails and, and schedules and topics. But we need to really be a major part uh, so they don't think, well, this is just a part-time uh, class. It really is part of, they're, they're, they're invested in this as much as I am. Uh, a, a supportive online community, which could be you, it could be student to student, it could be all types of organizations. And this comes back to our design and, and how we're designing this so that it is the most effective. I, I, you know, I say this a million times and I think people really do have some pretty good guides and clarifications, but every time, even myself, I find myself saying, oh yeah, it's, I meant that and I wrote this and Okay, so I have to update and update and update. So you may want to try to actually beta or pilot some of your um, clear, um, expectations and your communication and have students ask questions and then update some of those so that you really are making sure that everybody understands clearly what it is that they need to do early on. Uh, and then I'm, I'm sure that you're thinking about this, this difference between real time and non real time. Uh, this has been one of really major issue and I just finished submitting a, some research that I did the past six months on which, which way to, to go with this. And, and I'm here to tell you, there's not a better way, uh, asynchronous, you know, uh, offline kind of between classes or real time. There's not a, a better way or a worse way. There's a, there's a more aligned way. And so you have to think about the activities that you have and really, really think about the ones that they, they will benefit the most with you. And then think about things that they can do in between times that they're with you and, and really organize uh, your structure in that way. Lots of informal feedback. Uh, I offer a program where I come in and I do some of this. I'm sure that you can do this with some surveys, but I also would encourage you to really uh, provide kind of alternate ways, allowing them to express themselves in, in WeChats or on Google Docs or some way that you can actually get every student to give their voices uh, so that you know where they're at. And obviously try to figure out some discussions. Uh, I hear a lot that discussions don't work and I always challenge that because I think that discussions can work but it really comes down to how we structured it, what kind of questions we have, how we're allowing them to represent their conceptual understanding. Some students like to verbalize, some students like to write, some students like to, to draw. Uh, so we need to think about how we might wanna uh, tend to their representations. And the bottom line, some, some real basic ingredients. If, if you're at the beginning of these or you wanna have kind of a checklist, um, uh, you know, be aware of, of, of cognitive load. Uh, this is one thing that we, we hear this term and we're like, oh, I think I know what that means, right? Um, uh, we forget sometimes that even something as ba basic as our PowerPoints, we've seen the, the presentations a million times. Uh, most students look at it for the first time and they need to process it. This is especially true if you're presenting graphs and tables. You want to allow them some time to process that before you jump in and ask some questions. And also if we're presenting a lot of new material, um, they're going to have to basically go through their, their cognitive load and, and they're going to triage that and they're only gonna catch portions of that. So partly that's why you need the feedback and partly you need to really think about how you're developing your presentations. I'll remind you of some research that I shared last uh, semester of sim the simple six by six rule. You might wanna go back and take a look at your PowerPoints and think about that six by six rule, which simply says the best way that we can really measure our cognitive load is to only have six bullets with six words on each line. Now, if you have more, that's fine. Uh, but that's just a rule of thumb to really think about the six by six. Most people can actually load a six by six. We want to trim and really triage our content. And usually people think, oh, well, I'm just going to water that down. And that's not really what the point is. Um, this means that you really have to, it's more on our, our, our um, plate, that we've got to really be um, insightful as to what are those driving questions, those essential elements, and make sure that we're really hitting those and then some process skills that allows them to be more self-regulated afterwards. Uh, you know, clear and frequent, uh, you wanna think about this scaffolding concept. So how can you kind of take them through bit by bit, breadcrumbs, I'm sure you've heard some of these concepts. 
Um, you need to be uh, engaging. This doesn't mean you need to be jumping up and down, uh, but you do need to be both present and engaging and connect with them and, and realize that they're humans behind this machine and they're, they have feelings and emotions and they're gonna be hungry and tired. And, uh, and so we need to kind of do that to the maximum of our ability. Not everybody's gonna be uh, jumping up and down. And obviously include a, as much active learning as you can. Some people are using this as an excuse of, well, I'm online, I can't do this. And I, I'm gonna apologize. I feel in this one hour, I'm not gonna be able to get us active uh, as much as I would if we were uh, face to face. But what I'm hoping is that this is, you know, 60 minutes of material and then follow up, either you're following up uh, on your own, or you're following up with me uh, to think about how you might use these. So I, I like this graphic a lot because I think this really, um, uh, says clearly how a lot of people's view a lot of our, our teaching, right? We think teaching is linear. Uh, we've got this plan. It's a very kind of what we call deductive approach uh, strategy of, you know, step one, step two, step two. We're going to start with the easiest and build upon it. Here's our schedule. And, you know, done. We're all done and dusted. When in actuality, the reality is um, there's a lot of, 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 you know, valleys and peaks and, and hurdles and blocks and so forth. Uh, this looks to me a bit daunting, but uh, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really want a job that was, you know, simply riding a bike easy on a very flat road. I like the challenges that comes with the reality of building some of these. Uh, I think part of what we need to realize is, is developing, um, you know, backup plans and contingencies and be ready for some of those things and embracing some of those. And this, I think, was helpful to us, but it's also helpful if we build that mindset uh, into our students. Because our students, I think, they think or they want to have this smooth road ahead of them. But we all know that the folks that can really handle some of the bumps are going to be the most successful. Now, I won't go into this in detail, but I do like to remind folks that we did have a session on information processing. Uh, and definitely, when we think about uh, any kind of teaching and learning, especially online, we need to make sure that we're focusing on how our students are processing. And just very quickly, we all kind of do this, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. Uh, we have an input. Right. Hopefully I'm part of your input. You're at home now. Students are at home and they have probably some other inputs. They might be hot or cold. They might have a, a dog or a cat. They might have a, a child. They might have food. And so these are things, some new inputs uh, that they're having to sense when they're at home trying to work online. We have to think about that. We have to manage that. We have to suggest and recommend possibly some places that they might want to put themselves so they can actually attend to the, to the input that we want to provide to them. If they can do that, they'll basically process that information into what's called STM. This is our short-term memory. Some people call this our working memory. Uh, this is where during the synchronous sessions, they're probably more active and they're, they're thinking about some things and connecting and maybe doing some group work. And we're doing this so that, and this is where our methodology comes into play, so that ultimately they can transfer that information over into long-term memory, LTM. And theoretically, once we are at the, the LTM, um, this is where we're going to be able to kind of maintain that information uh, upon subsequent kind of prompts or cues that we can recall that. A brief reminder that we need to have some of that coding in parallel. So we might want to make sure that we are coding uh, either a linear or nonlinear way, but, but the way that we code or, or add that information to our schema uh, is going to be critical if we're kind of decoding that or recalling that. Uh, so there's, this is a really deep, heavy model. We use this a lot. Uh, you may want to, once you get your design finished and you really feel good about your online course, you may step back and say, um, you know, for this particular day, how are my students? How do I expect my students to process this information? And how am I facilitating uh, their sensory memory? How am I uh, facilitating, uh, you know, transferring information from their working memory to someplace really deep inside uh, of their cognitive skills so that they can recall that? And so this is a bit of a checklist once you feel like that you're finished with them. Um, your initial design. Um, so with that, I wanted to do, do a quick review. So we are about 25 minutes into this. I'm going to take the next 25 minutes and really try to drill down on this concept. And, and I can't imagine that everyone at some point has been, uh, I'll use the word evaluated, their teaching has been evaluated. You've had somebody step into your room or you've had a peer uh, or somebody has judged you in, in your teaching ability. Um, I struggle with this as someone who's been in this business a long time of this concept of evaluation. So I'm going to really share with you a different model. Uh, this is a protocol that I've developed over the past two decades and I've published uh, now two papers on. Uh, I'm really looking at very intentionally assessing, measuring, and evaluating 
uh, what I call the art and science. You know, sometimes people say that teaching is, is more of an art. And, and as a chemist uh, and a social scientist, sometimes I think about it as a science and, and it's both. And I think that's, that's what we need to really think about is, is when are we capitalizing on, on those and realizing that teaching is a human endeavor. Um, sometimes I have to remind folks that, that we are humans, our students are humans, we will all behave like humans. Uh, we love that part sometimes, but sometimes humans do some really uh, interesting things. So that's the, the, the art of it. But at the same time, we can integrate some of the science. Uh, hopefully in the next 30 minutes or so uh, after that, you'll be able to integrate what I call the AIM method. So A-M-E, assessment, measurement, evaluation, as part of your continuous improvement. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine that anyone who's on this, um, this Zoom thinks that, that, this, that there's an endpoint that you, you work and you become good teacher and then you're done. <laughs> that I don't know anything really worthwhile. Uh, you work and you become better and then you work and better and work and work and work and then you die. <laughs> that there, there really is, there's no end point of becoming a good teacher. You've got to constantly be improving, constantly be thinking about this, which is kind of uh, the fun and the challenge. And then ultimately, I'm going to share with you a tool uh, that I'll give this to you if anybody would like it that you can use to do some of your own assessment and measurement and monitoring of continuous improvement of, of your teaching. So I do want to start with a bit of these operational definitions. I think I shared this slide briefly last semester, so hopefully a few of you might recall this. But this is really going to be key terms uh, from this point on for the next 30 minutes. Uh, nothing else will make sense unless we really think about these terms in this way. Uh, so what I call the AIM, the Assessment, Measurement, and Evaluation, and it's built in this order for a reason. Um, I, I have a hard time evaluating anything unless I've done the first two steps, and you'll see why this is so. So assessment, in, in this context, assessment basically is gathering behavior, gathering data of behavior. Um, right now, I'm gathering behavior. I'm a little bit warm. Um, my stomach's okay, I just ate breakfast. Uh, you know, we all are gathering these types of sensory behaviors. Maybe you're doing the same thing. Maybe you've worked hard, maybe you're kind of tired. Uh, there's all these things. So assessment just simply means that. Now, uh, in my class, I like to gather behaviors that align with my content. So I like to gather behaviors to, to determine whether students can behave like a chemist, can operate like a chemist, can speak like a chemist. Those are behaviors, right? Those behaviors can turn into skills. Can they, can they, can they actually move man, maneuver um, things like, like a chemist? And so we like to gather lots and lots of assessment. Um, there's two forms, and you probably heard of these, formative and summative. Formative is in the formation of, it's usually low stakes. Maybe it's even ungraded. Uh, we like to do a lot of that, check and balance, feedback, how are you doing, you know, milestones and benchmarks. And, uh, and so a lot of high frequency, um, low stakes assessment will be the, the, the driver. Now to do this well, the second step is we need to know what, what we're looking for, right? What, what, what are measures of success? Now for me, I can look at someone and say, they're behaving like a chemist, okay? They're, 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 they have attributes and characteristics uh, and they do things like a chemist. Now, why can I do that? And why can you do it in your field? Because you're experts. You know how, what that's all about. Our students are not experts. Our students are novice. So they don't even know really at this point what it is, what are this criteria? What, what will make them successful? And so we need to be very clear about this, this how we're gonna measure them. Uh, typically, we do this with what's called an analytical rubric, uh, and that rubric lists out some gradations of what success might look like. And these behaviors have to be as detailed as possible, as authentic as possible, because again, the students are looking at this with, with a lens that's different than ours. And I always challenge teachers to, can you think about your content before you knew it? It's one of the most difficult things to do uh, in our lives, to think about something before we knew it, because we just instantly make this assumption uh, that, oh, well, of course, this and this. Uh, and so you might want to, as a, as a practice, try to learn a new, a new skill and remember what it's like to know nothing and then build upon that because that's where your students are. So once we have something really solid, and, and I'll even remind people that a, a good measurement tool like a rubric needs to be calibrated. And so just because you wrote one doesn't mean that it might be effective. And I can share with you some techniques on how to calibrate this. Uh, but if you even go to the point where you can determine what's called uh, an inner um, rate of reliability coefficient. So you can do some quantitative statistics on whether that rubric will be effective 
through time, through projects. Uh, so if you're interested in that, we, have, we can certainly talk about that um, a little bit later. But then the final step is the evaluation. And that's why a lot of people will, will jump directly to this, to, the, to making a judgment. Uh, and I have a hard time as a chemist, I need lots of data before I can make a judgment whether something is good or bad. Um, yeah, you know, I take one bite of food, uh, maybe it's good or bad, but I usually have to take a couple bites and maybe smell it and take a look at it. And I can't basically say, oh, this is good or bad. The same thing with, with students and students' work is that I wanna, I wanna have a lot of behavioral data. Uh, I wanna know clearly and, and make sure that they know clearly what it is that, that it is I'm measuring. Uh, far too often we try to measure something and we end up really measuring what's called a confounding variable. So we measure things that really aren't uh, tied to what it is that we're looking to measure. Uh, but ultimately we do have to make a judgment. We do have to say good, bad, yes, no, A, B, uh, but we can only do that uh, reliably and, and in a valid way if we have a lot of this subsequent data. So you'll see me using these terms a lot, assessment, measurement, evaluation, and this entire protocol that I'm gonna share with you next is built upon those, those terms. So this is in one slide, uh, this is the protocol. Now it's, it is, I'll admit right up front, it's very detailed, it's very intense. Uh, I would never recommend somebody to, to take this all at once. You may want to think about um, this next semester, doing a couple of these and the following semester, a couple more. And in a couple of years, uh, you might build up uh, to really having this system down. So uh, I do this on purpose because I know that, that people are at different points of their career. And so I wanna make sure that everybody can actually attach themselves to this in some form or, or another. Um, I am gonna actually walk through each one of these steps and uh, one by one, and hopefully through this, uh, you'll figure out where you're at and which one you would like to, to start with. And I will give uh, any and all of this, um, these are some templates and some checklists. I'm happy to give any of these that, that you would like. But obviously you see in the blue is the, uh, is the theme, what we call the theoretical framework, the AIM framework, assessment, measurement, and evaluation. And uh, hopefully I, I just am repeating what I just said about you need a lot of assessment data. So you see a lot of things that are under assessment and really nothing underneath measurement and evaluation. That's how important assessment is. Uh, for an assessment for your, when you teach, and you could actually do this yourself, you could get a colleague to do it, maybe you get a department um, lead or supervisor, manager, uh, I would recommend that you start off doing this yourself and do a self-assessment of these. Um, so a pre-observation coming to your class, and then within the observation, I've come up with these three different parts of a quantitative, a qualitative, and a graphical representation, and then a post, and then a rubric, and this evaluation. I'll walk you through each one of these uh, one by one. I will, uh, let me pause for a second because I see some um, um, chat questions. Uh, I can go out and check those, but if anyone has a question about anything so far, I can pause and see if there's any critical question that I can answer uh, now. Again, I apologize for throwing all this information at you. I'm trying to kind of work with the synchronous and asynchronous, and if there's anything you like unpacking, um, I'll definitely look at the questions on the chat later and answer all of those. So during the pre-observation, and again, these are things that you can do yourself. Uh, you can basically say, so before I go into a classroom, do I know the answer to these questions? Um, when I observe, and I do this a lot, I've done it about 500 times over the past uh, decade, uh, you know, what do the students have been asked to do? Uh, in a nutshell, I usually ask faculty three basic questions. Uh, what do you have in plan for students to do? Uh, what do you plan to do? And then the third question is a bit tricky of when you're done with that class, how do you know number one and two happened? You know, what evidence do you have that they did what you wanted them to do and that you did what you wanted to do? Some people use the word assessment and I, I just basically keep it that simple. What are you going to do? How do you know it happened? And if we constantly ask ourselves that, I think we become better, better at planning and being clear of our expectations. Uh, and our students, they catch on to that quickly. They're like, wow, this person's really prepared and they, they know what they're doing and, and therefore I know what I'm doing. Uh, what are your outcomes? Uh, I think hopefully no one is going into their class or their other, um, any of their classes and courses without those outcomes really, really clearly uh, delineated and aligned and measurable. Uh, what kind of teaching approaches? Some people call these strategies or methods. Uh, these should be varied. They should be aligned to whatever you're trying to do. Uh, they can be kind of superficial and, and stepwise, or they can be really deep and, and really kind of getting 
into the learning theories and you know constructivism and metacognition and self-efficacy and self-regulation and uh, so it depends on where you are in your career you know where you want to kind of uh, dig into some of those what are your goals you know do you plan on just going in and uh, i got to tell you right up front one of my number one goals when i go in to teach um, is to have fun i don't know about you but why not <laughs> i mean you know we're not the students anymore, we're the teachers. So we get to determine if this is gonna be brutally painful or it's gonna be enjoyable. And I, I don't know, I enjoy chemistry. Maybe my students don't, but if I don't appear as though I'm enjoying this, how can I ever expect them to enjoy it? So that's my number one goal. We're all gonna have a good time. Now I do have to operationalize what fun means to me. It may mean different things uh, to students. Uh, what, can, what can you be expect to be doing, right? The key here is, is you and doing, and what do you want the students to be doing? There should be something going on there. And ultimately, as I mentioned, how are you going to know when the day is over, not when the semester is over, but when that day, when that session, when that hour, when that two-hour online is over, uh, how do you know which and, and to what depth you've met your learning outcomes? So then I walk into the classroom, and, and again, you can do this, you can share this. Um, I use uh, Nancy Chisholm's work, uh, 205, and then she updated this 2011. She's got a 100-item checklist, and I'm always a little bit apprehensive at using checklists. Uh, I never would use them by themselves. I use them in, in, in tandem with something else. They're a great place to keep consistency, keep on track, and, and all of these, this is a, a portion of that list. Um, None of them are, are crazy or they're not perfect, but they're ways to kind of keep you, uh, to remind you of the things you should be looking for. I find that a lot of people observe classes with a blank piece of paper. And I don't know how they do that. They're probably a lot smarter than I am, but I need something to kind of keep track and to kind of see where things are going and, and make some notes. Uh, this is a very extensive list. Uh, at the beginning, you probably wouldn't use all 100 items. You might pick a portion of it and then each time build upon that. Uh, but this is just a way to, to kind of keep you on, on track. I, I'm hesitant at giving people the list and only the list because some people will, will say, well, I checked off 80 of those, so I must be good. And, and we all know that part of the art and science of teaching, that's not um, how this goes. So with that, we have to have other uh, pieces of evidence. And so I really, really rely on the next two portions more than almost anything. Uh, the first one is a qualitative. And this one is a little more... This one's hard. Uh, I, I, I know because I've done it so much, it's, uh, it's easier for me to do, but I would recommend um, to think about this. So the qualitative data really kind of uncovers a lot of things that maybe we don't see otherwise. What I do is I basically take field notes. I take detailed field notes when I'm in the sessions of absolutely everything that happens in the session. This is just an example taken uh, from one, you know, students arrive at this time, they rearrange, the learning environment is this, it's flexible, whatever. Uh, a lot of times I'll basically say at 921, you know, a female student raises her hand, she asks this question, the instructor responds by sharing this. So I really document absolutely everything. Now to me, it doesn't mean anything because I don't really, I don't know what the plan was, I don't know what's going on. But when I share this with the, the, the teacher, they make sense of this and they say things like, oh great, I'm glad this happened, or I'm glad that they responded, or wow, I didn't mean for that, and I really got off base here. So it means something to you, but probably only you, um, to think about continuous improvement and, and, and what to do next. Some people will say, well, why don't you just bring a video camera into the room and video? And you certainly can do that, but most of the research that I've read indicates clearly that whenever you have a camera in the room, behaviors are changed. Um, the students become quieter, uh, the faculty member may become more reserved and, and watch what they're saying and not as, you know, um, they're not as much as themselves. And so it kind of biases the data when you bring in something like that. Uh, other people will say, well, you bring in a stranger in there to observe. And yes, the first five to 10 minutes, uh, people know that I or a stranger or somebody uh, is in the room. But after that, they quickly forget, they acclimate, and, and you can kind of collect some what we call unobtrusive or less obtrusive data. So this is really nice to be able to do and just collect um, this information so that you can then add it to the, the quantitative. So now I've got the quantitative and the qualitative. I have to say though that if I only had one way to collect some, some information, I would use this one. And this is something that I actually developed, um, I stole, I borrowed when I was seven years of age. Uh, quick story, I was, I, I was raised in a very small rural town in Indiana. Uh, Indiana is known for its basketball. My father was a basketball coach. And so he would ask me uh, to sit at the end of the bench 
and he gave me a, a piece of paper with the, the outline of the, the basketball court. And he said, when, when our players shoot the ball, put an X in the location they shot it. If they hit it, circle it. And then at halftime, he could go in and he could determine where he was being successful, inside, outside, zone, man-to-man, -man, what, he, what he was uh, using for his offense, and then change his strategy. And as I started to do you know, uh, teaching and learning uh, observations, I thought, wow, maybe I could use something like that because that's kind of what we're doing. We're trying to see where we're successful, continually monitoring where that might happen. And so I came up with this approach, and I know this looks kind of just like scratches on a paper, but these are two examples of, of what, I, what I do. On, on the right side with the, the red and blue, uh, what this is is the students are represented, male and female students. The little blue marked by them means that they, uh, that they publicly represented themselves. They raised their hand, they spoke out. Uh, so I basically wrote a, a, just a line that how many times they did that. Uh, the red X is the movement of the instructor through time. And so as they would move from the front to the left, whatever, I would mark down so they could see their movement. Um, and you can see, uh, you may see an FB there at the back occasionally. There's, a, I make some codes for like, that means Facebook. Uh, it means that that student was on Facebook a lot of the time. I could see their computer and they were on some sort of social media. Uh, the VL means they were very late to class. They arrived late. And so these are just notes. So this is a smaller class. The other one is a class of 300. Um, and, and you can even see that. It's, I didn't have my collar pin with me, but you can see that the instructor walked up and down the aisles which is kind of unusual for a large 300 person lecture auditorium type, uh, type seating. And uh, this means nothing to me, it may mean nothing to you, but when I show this to faculty members, instantly they attach names to these people, uh, they know the people that are speaking, that aren't speaking, they know why they moved, they, and then they, they, just, they just analyze this. I usually just sit back for 10 minutes and let them read it and, and talk. And then ultimately they start to ask questions. And what's most powerful about this is that I'm not asking them questions and I'm not telling them what to do. They're asking questions about their behavior and their students' behaviors in their class, which is really rare. Uh, when we do workshops, we have to talk in theory. When we talk with colleagues, we have to give examples. But this allows us to really talk about at least one specific case in point in their classroom um, that they can really dig down and say, hmm, I wonder why uh, this group of students are, are more vocal and this group of students aren't. Are, um, I found many times uh, that the left side of the room, you know, ask a lot of questions and typically it aligns with that's where the podium is and that's where the professor spends most of the time. Or we have what's called the tea box, which means that the, the students sitting at the front and down the middle, they're asking a lot of questions and the people that are hiding in the nesters in the corners aren't. And so faculty will say, how can I get them to speak? And I'll say, well, first of all, is that one of your outcomes? Is that your goal? Is it, is it critical that they speak in your class? And, and they have to kind of rationalize why they're wanting certain things to happen. And once they define what it is that they want to have measured and, and happen, then I facilitate that. I can provide suggestions and strategies and research uh, and ideas on how to, to accomplish their goals, not my goals. What I want to have happen has nothing to do with it. Um, I need to figure out what it is that they're doing, their comfort level, their philosophy, and kind of align that and provide them the support and some strategies so that they can accomplish what they love to do. So if I only had one thing that I was going to use, uh, I probably would use this. I would walk in and I would diagram everything in a visual way, uh, really itemize who was speaking, who wasn't speaking, the movements and so forth, and then just sit down and lay it in front of uh, the faculty member and say, uh, what do you think? And I guarantee you that each one of you will look at this and interpret it in your own individual way. And when it comes down to evaluating effective teaching, this is the first step. You've got to figure out where you are, how you behave. Um, now the really sharp teachers will do this early. I, sometimes I get a lot of, of teachers will say, well, come in later when I've got, it, when I've got my class set up and good. And I'm like, I'm, no, I'm of less used to you if you get it done perfectly and then you invite somebody in. You want to invite somebody in early and often. So maybe have somebody come in each semester, maybe twice a semester, and then continue to you know, change some things, see how that worked out, change some things, see how it worked out, and then monitor the growth or the changes in this um, through time. I think that that's probably going to be really helpful if you can just find a way um, to do that. Uh, this is usually when there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to pause a little bit if there are any questions that you either want to, uh, to share or I can answer uh, of those.
Again, I'm trying to be careful. Good. I've got like 10 minutes left, so I'm going to, uh, because I want to make sure I get to some of the next sessions. Uh, now, what's key is, is afterwards, like, what are you going to do? Well, you do have to have a bit of a, a post observation. And some of these can be done on your own. You can reflect and you can say, well, how do you think the class went, right? And of course, how did students think the class went? And this is easy to, to just, you know, have an idea of this. But then I'll push a little bit, you know, do you have any evidence? Like, if I think the class went well. Thank you. What evidence do you have that it went well? Oh, I felt good. Okay, cool. How about the students? How do you think they thought? Oh, I think they really enjoyed it. Okay, what, in, what evidence? Well, they smiled. Uh, they nodded. Okay, those are fine, what we call indirect measures. Do you have any direct measures of evidence that indicated that you or they um, thought that it went well, they could do something differently, you learned something, all these are, so I'd encourage you to think about how you're gathering that evidence. Um, how do you feel about the class? And did students accomplish the outcomes? Again, these are more of these, these direct measures. So the, the post observations are really key. You might even build up a cycle of asking yourself these questions after every time uh, you teach. And then I'll, I'll, I'll ultimately, if there are some things that didn't work well, you know, what are you gonna do to modify this? And if you're gonna teach a course over and over, you might document that. And then the next time, the next year, the next semester, you might reflect upon that because we're gonna forget from, from year to year, from semester to semester of what that might be. So that's the assessment portion. You see, I spent a lot of time on assessment. If all you did was assessment this next semester of your online courses, I think you're gonna find it time well spent. If you'd like to think about doing some measurement, uh, you can certainly create your own rubric, but I've actually created a, a very large, everything incorporated. So I'm, I don't, this is a portion of it. I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, but keep in mind that this is really, really, really kind of intensive. Um, I don't like to scare people off and, and have them look at this and go, oh my goodness, you know, I can never do all this. And of course you can, you, you can't do it all today, uh, but this would be maybe a year, two, four, five year plan. Uh, and the way that I set this up is, is, a, is kind of an action oriented, is that you would read the attributes, the criteria, which would be on the left hand side there. In this case, it's lesson planning, concepts, session goals, and so forth. And then you would basically write down, you could, this is a, would be a Google Sheet, you would copy and paste um, each one of these into its corresponding column. So if you thought that you were just at the beginning of, uh, you know, articulating your, your learning outcomes, then you would put it in that kind of the red initial column. Uh, if you thought that it, you were kind of emerging and you, you had some of it going, but you still needed to work on it, uh, then you would put it there. If you thought you were fully developed and you really felt comfortable about those, then you would move it over to that last column. And you can see after you've progressed through this, this uh, rubric is that ultimately you would have a roadmap. You would have a faculty development plan for yourself of what you needed to work on the next month, the next year. And I would recommend that you focus on all of the items that, that you placed in the initial column and month by month, year by year, uh, you should see each one of those shift, shift, shift. And so ultimately, probably a couple of years, if not five or 10 years later, all of these attributes would be in the fully developed column. Uh, and I would remind us that chances are this is going to be different for each class that you teach, each level that you teach. Uh, so this isn't a one size fits all. There's probably going to be a, a rubric like this for each of your classes and, and it may kind of go in different levels. Uh, but this would be a really detailed way to analytically monitor your progress and walk through each one of these uh, sessions. Obviously, the more honest you are, uh, the better this is going to work out. Uh, to just you know, copy and paste them all into the developing session doesn't really going to probably help you out as much as be a little more critical on yourself and, and work on some things. So that's uh, the rubric that you can access, or I'll share that with you, and I'll show you what, where, where that's at in just a minute. Um, I do want to remind folks in the last uh, five or six minutes that some things that you might think about that will build into all these is, is um, you know, what's called a teaching philosophy or a teaching statement. This is all the driver for what we do. Uh, you might want to think about or even write down, you know, why you teach and the way that you teach and how are you creating these accessible, inclusive environments? Um, does your teaching facilitate this learning? And I'll, I'll, you know, the last part here is, you know, what's going to be evidence that you've gathered uh, to really you know, I don't mean to, to push too hard, but to really be confident uh, that you're able to do these. And some people will say, well, what do you mean by this evidence uh, of learning? Well, 
So here's some, some ways that you can actually gather direct evidence, direct measurable evidence um, of some outcomes. Uh, you know, want to minimize, we, we, we always think about these student evaluations of teaching, and we, we tend to say that those are necessary but insufficient. There's plenty of literature, data, research that indicates that we probably shouldn't be focusing on that. Uh, but we do want to actually gather and create what's called teaching material. Uh, but at the same time, this isn't just what you're generating. These lesson plans and presentations, there's research on these. If you'd like to know the research on presentations, I've got a presentation program uh, that shows with, to you exactly the kind of uh, way that you should present. Uh, the six by six rule is one of those, but there's other things like font size and how you kind of create these. And so this isn't just teaching material, but it's research-based teaching material. So that would be a, a direct measure. A well-designed effective syllabus. This isn't one that you just create a, a schedule for, um, but if, if you're interested, I can walk you through my course design um, studio, which you align your outcomes, you align your assessments, you align uh, the way you use technology, and that therefore has some, some background of why you think it's um, a well-designed syllabus. These assessments, I mentioned the rubrics, but also even if you're gonna do an exam, uh, I would challenge you that do you have what's called an item analysis that's been performed on the exam, which means it's not about the students, it's about you and each of these items for your test instrument. There are calculations for discrimination indices and difficulty levels that you can calculate. So when you say I have a, a valid reliable assessment, you have documentation, you have actual quantitative numbers that can verify that that's what this is. A clinical class observations would be by someone like me or someone who actually is following a protocol, gathering this information in a very systematic way. Do you have some of those observations? And more importantly, how you've reacted and you've continually improved upon those. Uh, are you doing any research? And this doesn't have to mean a, a public uh, published journal. Uh, it can literally be a, a question, a hypothesis, gathering some data to figure out what worked and what didn't work. If you're doing that, writing that up in a paragraph or a page or something that shows that you actually are looking at teaching as, as research. Have you been a guest speaker? And if so, what evidence, I know you're tired of me saying that, but what evidence do you have that the students that you worked with during that guest presentation, that they've integrated into their class, their project, their career. This is something you may have to work with the lead teacher to, to gather that. And of course, peer uh, performance evaluations from peers and deans and so forth. Again, I would always challenge and I would remind those people coming into your class, uh, share with me, you know, how are you gonna collect the data? Uh, what's the, the background of the data? Does it really align with effective teaching and research? And then ultimately, especially in today's world, uh, the past six months, uh, what kind of a teaching e-portfolio do you have? Hopefully you're gathering, creating, curating a lot of different videos and representations uh, of media with your teaching. How are you gonna organize that? You could do a website, you could do a, a Google a folder. There's lots of ways I would encourage you to start to actually collate and curate those uh, artifacts so that you can share those, uh, with, which represents direct evidence uh, of your teaching. So after you do all that, the last thing that you wanna do, and then I'm gonna spend like two seconds on this because I really think that, that that's how much we should be spending on evaluation, although most of the time we, we tend to spend a lot of time on evaluation, uh, is taking all that data that we just went through over the past 35 minutes and uh, creating uh, tables and charts and figures and, and really digesting it in a way so that somebody can read this and come to some conclusions to them. Uh, the ongoing development of, of what you're gonna do to me, that's the most important thing is how you are analyzing and interpreting and making an action plan for your next steps. That's something I'd much rather see than, than the data in itself. Uh, and doing this in a way, not just because we're online more, but doing this in a way that we can actually give more information, more useful information using some digital audio, some digital video. The very last slide and the timing is working out well. I've got like three minutes left. I actually do perform what's called a midterm student perception. I'd encourage you to do this of having a colleague come in and work with your students for the last 10 minutes of class. You leave, and I do this online as well. You know, the instructor leaves, and I work with the students. I typically ask them these three questions. I gather that information. I do a quick qualitative analysis, and then I create kind of an aggregated um, data set that then I share with the faculty member, and we talk about what this data means and what they might be able to do halfway through the course. Um, to me, the end of the session, uh, student evaluations aren't nearly as powerful because what do you do with that? The class is over. But if you can get some data halfway through, and if you need to modify, remediate, update some things, you can do it at that point. These are great things to add uh, to your electronic portfolio um, as well. All right, that was, uh, I'm glad to see. Sorry, I kind of rushed through that. Um, but I am going to stop sharing just for a moment. And I am going to...
stop recording actually and